to room at the bottom, but even more in a fractal. So please. Now you do, I hope. Okay. So, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for setting up this very nice conference. I'm enjoying it a lot. And all the previous speakers for the very inspiring talks. I apologize, I have changed my title. After I have seen the talks yesterday, I thought that one maybe would fit better. So, we are celebrating this year, 100 years of the birth of Feynman. And it's time for us to honor him and acknowledge his legacy. You certainly all know about his contribution on path integrals because this started to be immediately used. And this is a kind of thing that I use a lot in my collaboration with the Brazilians, for instance, to study excitons in transition metal dichalcogenides and to predict things like a quantum valley hole effect driven by interactions. And this is a fascinating field because with the uh, emergence of these new 2G materials like graphene or transition metal dichalcogenides, we have been faced to a completely new situation in physics where Maxwell QEG doesn't really apply. Because we know how to do Maxwell QEG in 2 plus 1, 3 plus 1, n plus 1. But it implies implicitly that the electrons and the photons intermediate in their interactions live in the same dimension. But for these materials, the electrons are in 2G and the photons are in 3G. So you have to project. We start with QEG 3 plus 1 and then you project into the plane and you get something very nice that Marino named pseudo QEG many, many years ago when he was in Princeton and did the first uh, studies of that. And we have now been applying that to condensed matter. These are just two examples of uh, our collaboration with all the people in Belém. And Leandro is now in the heart of the Amazonas region, in a place that you have to go only by boat five hours from Belém. So they are doing path integrals deep in the Amazonas region in Brazil. For the ones who don't know it, it's good to learn. And we have been now calculating things like lifetime of excitons and exciton uh, energies and so on, and deriving things from a bottom up, pers a, a top bottom perspective from QEG. Okay, but the second thing that Feynman brought us that is very important also, and it was not immediately recognized as important, is this idea of quantum simulators. And the idea is to use this bottom-up approach, as we heard already. We had Raimundo talking about it, and Teresa, and we had then afterwards the colloquium by Gabe Apley. And he said this very famous sentence, there is plenty of room at the bottom, with the idea we can build up new systems that we can engineer, that we can understand and tune and control to try to understand more complicated systems that are not tunable. So the field of quantum simulators started then using ultra-cold atoms in optical lattices, as we have seen yesterday. And these systems are fascinating because, first of all, you decide how do you arrange your lasers, so you can decide on the geometry of the lattice. You do square, or you do triangular, honeycomb. You can control the lattice parameters, the height of the barriers, the hopping parameter, the lattice constant. You can load your lattice with bosons or with fermions or with both. You can control the interactions using the magnetic field via the Feshbach resonances and go from attractive to repulsive or no interactions. You can do longer range interactions as we heard from Raimundo with the dipolar ones. You have no disorder, but you can put disorder if you want and, and get the, the Anderson localization, for instance. It's very beautiful with the speckle disorder. You can engineer synthetic gauge fields. This is something I have been doing myself quite a lot. And you can do shaking. So you have lots of parameters at your disposal. And this is a fascinating field. And I have been working on it. I always have one PhD student in my group working on cold atoms. So for a while, I had leaking limb. And we were trying to do the synthetic gauge fields to go into the pseudo-gap phase of cuprates, because these materials were 
uh, argued to be a way to try to understand high TC. So it started long ago. And we have been trying to look at phases like the G-density wave or the pi flux phase from Marston and Affleck into these setups and understand their consequences. And more recently, we have been looking at the role of lattice distortions in controlling coherence. This is with Marco Di Liberto, who was my previous PhD student, or starting from the Varma phase uh, and looking at topological phases. But when you do quantum simulators with cold atoms, we are all the time talking about neutral objects. They have no charge. And if you look around, everything we do is electronics for our technology. So it's very important to do quantum simulations with electrons, and that's what we heard yesterday. And that's the way how Gabe is doing it with a silicon. So I thought it would be interesting to tell you about our new approach to do electronic quantum simulators using a different technique. And what I'm going to tell you today is how to build new models, new systems, new Hamiltonians, using the surface status of metals like copper, 111. Okay, so everything started with the pioneering work that has been already mentioned yesterday by Don Eigler with the quantum corals. And then a few years ago, in 2012, Hari Manoharan took it back to engineer what he called molecular graphene. So this first name guy here in the paper of Manoharan is a Brazilian, a, a Japanese Brazilian who is now a professor in the US. And the idea is the following. What is here in, in yellow is a gas of electrons in two dimensions. It's a surface state of copper. And then you adsorbate carbon monoxide, COs. These are the black spots. And they go everywhere in a completely random manner. Yes, copper 111, yes. And then what happens, oh, yeah, I can't see, oh no. I have a movie for you, but I can't get, ah, here, yep. You see, you come with the tip of the STM, you pick them up, all these, oh no, all these adsorbates one by one. Let me try again. You pick them one by one with the tip of the STM and you arrange them in a way that's convenient for you. You pattern this two deck. So it turns out that the COs act as a repulsive center, okay? So what he did, and it was extremely smart, if you pattern COs which are repelling the electrons in a triangular lattice, the electrons are going to form the dual lattice to the triangular, which is a honeycomb. And with this, he realized what he called a molecular graphene. Yes, it, it is precisely, uh, it has a, a diameter of about 0 0.6 nanometers, and it's, this is a real space imaging. It, it is kind of, it's kind of, yes. So he did that, but you see that the length scale here is 10 times larger than the atomic structure of the real graphene. It's on the nanometer scale, okay? And then he could then look at that, and he could look at the Dirac cone dispersion. Sorry, Gustavo, I have changed my talk. I will tell you the other one afterwards. <laughs> okay, so he could then measure this dispersion that is Dirac-like for his structure. It's very beautiful. If you look with the STM at the real graphene and at his molecular graphene, and you don't put the, the bar here, you will not know which is which. It's really pretty much the same. Okay, so he did this artificial graphene. But when he did, let me go back before I tell you the issue here. He had, first of all, he has a substrate that has triangular symmetry. He is patterning his COs with a triangular symmetry, which is very nice because it's compatible. And in addition, he's building a lattice that has a dual, because the dual of the honeycomb is the triangular. So the question we had is, can we generalize this technique? 
Can we build the lattices first that do not obey the underlying symmetry of the copper? Second, that do not have a dual. And if we can, which kind of lattice would be interesting to build? Well, if you talk to me, I will answer lib lattice. The lib lattice is the lattice of the perovskites, is the copper oxygen lattice. If you go to a high temperature superconductor and you look at the copper oxygen, you will have that the blue sides are occupied by copper and the red sides are occupied by oxygen. But we spent our lives forgetting about the oxygen and treating just the square lattice, right? Okay, this, uh, this lattice is extremely interesting. First, the unit cell has three sides. So in terms of pseudo-spin, graphene is pseudo-spin one half, has A, B sub lattices. This is pseudo-spin one, has three bands. Second, this lattice is very interesting because if you look at the blue side, it has four neighbors. If you look at the red side, it has two neighbors. So you have a lattice with sites with a different connectivity. And this is very important because every time when you get lattices with sites with a different connectivity, you get flat bands. And you are going to hear today in the last two talks the importance of flat bands. When you have flat bands, the kinetic energy is quenched. All the electrons have the same kinetic energy and the interactions become extremely important. So you will see how the use of these flat bands in bilayer graphene has been used to generate superconductors. Okay, so this lattice is very cute. And that's then I went to the group of my colleagues, Daniel van Meckelberg and Ingmar Svart, who are the experimentalists in Utrecht, to wonder whether we could generate such a lattice. And this we did. So we did the following. We did this setup that is here on the right. You see, you put several COs around to confine your region. And then we put five COs like this, so we suppress the center one, with the hope that the electrons are going to sit in the white regions around here. And that could simulate a lib lattice. So if this is a lib lattice, you are going to have the blue sides at the corner and the red at the, at the sides, at the center of the sides. And then this is a topographic image that they took at a current of one and one pair. And then you look at the GIGV that you learned yesterday, that you look at the local density of states. And when you are sitting on the red, you see this red curve here. In the blue, you get the blue. So you see here is your Dirac cone. And here is your flat band, where you have a very large density of states. You can identify that the corner sites are giving you the Duracon, and the side sites with only two neighbors are giving you your flat band with the large density of states. So we did the tight binding calculations for that, and this is the kind of curves that we get, the red and the blue. So all the main features with the large peak and the large peak here and the small peak here and so on, they are all there. They have been captured. So good, you can do it for a generic lattice. This is nice. And then what you do is now you will sit at certain energies that, for instance, this is a nice energy to sit and look at the wave function maps. And here, for instance, the red and the blues have the same intensity. So look at this red square. In the center, you have the blue, and at the edges, you have the red. You see they all have the same intensity. And you reproduce this using two types of calculations. I will explain you that one in a minute. And the tight binding that you all know. But now if you go to a different energy, for instance, here at uh, minus 0 0.05, the red at the, at the edges here are very intense. And the blue is, is suppressed. It's gray. And if you come here now at this energy where the blue is very intense and the red is gray, you get this kind of figures. So the theory is explaining very well the kind of wave function mappings that we are get. That's nice. But then you say, OK, can we do something more interesting with this technique? OK, Lib lattice is nice. It has a flat band. 
we want to investigate, so what's my focus? My focus are quantum effects. I want to reach novel quantum states of matter. For this, we usually have to go to low dimensions because quantum effects manifest better at low dimensions. So as it concerns the role of interactions, we know that in 3G, although electrons are interacting, they behave like a non-interacting Fermi liquid. We just renormalize the mass and we can treat them as non-interacting quasi-particles. If you go to 2D and you put a perpendicular magnetic field, I hope you have seen it uh, yesterday when it was also explained that you can get the quantum Hall effect. And what is very interesting, because there you have Landau levels where the kinetic energy is quenched, like in the flat bands, you can get excitations with fractional charge. So you fractionalize the electron charge in two dimensions. And if you go in 1D, you get a Luttinger liquid, the spin and the charge excitation separate. You get the spinons and the holons that are moving with the different velocities. So by going into lower dimensions, I am able to reach fractionalized kind of states that are extremely interesting, right? But how should electrons behave if I would go to fractional dimensions? I already know how it is 3G, 2D, 1D. People have been working on it for so long. What about fractional dimensions? Well, you say, what the frack? Yeah, so let's see where do we find in nature fractional dimensions. The answer are fractals. So let's look at a very simple one. This is the called Sierpinski triangle. So you take a triangle and you cut an inverted triangle in the center. Now in the remaining triangles, you cut another inverted triangle. Now in the remaining triangles, you cut another inverted triangle. And you go on, ad infinitum. And then you get a Sierpinski triangle. And the dimension of the Sierpinski triangle is 1.58. It is given by log n log s. What is this? How do I understand that? So let me show you. And in addition to this fractional dimension, these fractals, they, uh, they exhibit self-similarity. If I look at part, it is equal to the bigger one, and this one is equal to the bigger one, and so on. Let me explain you how do I come into this fract fractional dimension. Suppose that I am in one dimension. And now I do a scaling, and I multiply this length by 2. I double it. That's my scaling, S, 2. OK? And now I look at this new structure, and I ask how many of the previous one I can put into it. 1, 2. So the number is 2. The, the num uh, sorry, the, the scaling is 2. The number I am getting is 2. It means that the dimensionality is 1. OK, so here is the number, and here is the scaling. Suppose that now I have a square. I take the square, and I take the scaling 2. I take this side, and I double. I take this side, and I double. And now I, now I ask you, count how many of the previous structure I can put inside. 4. Here is the number. Here is the scaling. The exponent is the dimension, 2. Suppose that now I take a triangle. Please, let's do an exercise first. Forget about all the white holes that I have in this triangle, OK? Suppose that this triangle is completely filled. So let me now uh, make a scaling where I double the size of my triangle. I double this length. I double this length. And now I look at this entire triangle, how many of the original ones I can fit inside. One, two, three, four, if everything would be filled. I would get 4. So the number would be 4, the scaling would be 2, the dimensionality would be 2. But if I have a Sierpinski triangle, the central one is out. So now when I count how many of the original one I have, I have only 3. And the power is 1.58. OK? That's how mathematicians found out to count the dimensionality of a fractal. OK, very good. Remember that the Sierpinski triangle has, has dimensionality 158. Good. 
where do I find fractals? So fractals are pervasive in our daily life. I go to the supermarket and I find the cauliflowers. I go to Rome to visit a church and I find a Sierpinski tile from the beginning of the, the century after Christ. I look at the trees and I see the leaves. I go to a AJS CFT talk and I see the painting by Escher. This is a Dutch and there is a marvelous Escher museum in The Hague if you get an opportunity to visit. Yes. <laughs> if I open the book of Mandelbrot, I find that one that's also very fascinating. And why are fractals interesting? Well, first of all, they have a very interesting boundary length versus, versus surface area ratio, and they have a scale invariance. So they can be applied to build antennas, to store energy, to make poros systems, stretchable electronics. For instance, look at this. This is a fractal antenna to be used in your cell phone. And due to this scale invariance, they can send and receive long and small frequencies. So it's a very interesting system. You access two different degrees of freedom, two different length scales simultaneously. So they could be used in your cell phone. They are also very interesting to store energy. Look, this, if you make a solar cell, if you start from a planar or a Sierpinski fractal or a pin or a Hilbert, as you increase the complexity, you can store, this is the blue one, you can store more and more energy in your solar cells. You are using the space in a smarter way. Oops, sorry. Uh, our body knows this very well, so nature knows it. That's why all the trees are so fractal, to exchange sunlight and oxygen and uh, um, CO2. And that is also why our lungs are porous and fractal, right? Our body is very much fractal. It's a very interesting construction. And if you want to learn more about fractals, go to these TED Talks by Mandelbrot and wait a bit longer. There will be a mathematician afterwards telling you that the, the architecture in Africa is all fractal. So this guy has been going, traveling through Africa to show how much this is embedded into their culture. And you can even get fractal music. There is a lot of interesting stuff there. Okay, but what about quantum fractals? I told you I'm interested in the quantum world. Where do we find quantum fractals? There are very few. One of them is very well known, is the energy levels versus the, the flux per plaquette when you apply a perpendicular magnetic field to a lattice and you have an incommensurability as you change the flux per plaquette, you are changing the magnetic field, you change your magnetic length, and as it gets incommensurate with the lattice that you are applying your perpendicular magnetic field, you will get a fractal that looks like a butterfly. Another interesting quantum fractal is the whole resistance curve itself. This curve is a fractal. So for the fractional quantum Hall state, it is similar to that. And if you now go between two plateaus and you zoom in, you will see a new sequence which is precisely the same. It's the second generation of composite fermions. Oh, and this had been conjectured. Uh, back? Oh, sorry. The, the self-similarity of the quantum Hall resistance curve had been conjectured by Jürgen Smet in 2003. And at that time, Mark Gerbig was my PhD student, and we have shown it analytically, how you project further, and you get the same Hamiltonian with the same commutation relations. OK, but can we design electronic fractals? If we do so, what kind of fractionalization should I get? So please pay attention. Everything what I will be saying is at the single particle level. No interactions yet. OK? Only single particle. So how to design an electronic Sierpinski fractal? Very easy, right? Our underlying substrate is already triangular. So that one will be easier than the previous one. I simply have to take the CO's. You see the yellows are the copper. And now I take the CO's and I confine into this geometry, put one more in the center to cut the center of my triangle, and I hope that my electrons would be sitting onto these red, green, and blue sites. 
Okay, for the moment, it's just my theoretical imagination that they would be sitting into these sites. And I am putting these different colors there because the red sites have only one neighbor. The blue sites have three neighbors. And the green sites have two neighbors. What a nice lattice. Each site has a different number of neighbors. Okay? So, yes. This is going to give me a particle in a complicated box. It's a particle in a box, after all. And I can calculate the local density of state spectra and look at the wave function maps that I can calculate and I can measure with the hope to get something like a serpent skin. Okay. So, oh no. Why does it disappear? The connection is not so good. Okay, so this is what we did. We did a first, a second, and a third generation of a Sierpinski. Here you can see the topographic maps for the first, the second, and the third generation. And we are going to study this theoretically using two models. One is the tight binding with the nearest neighbor and next nearest neighbors. So the nearest neighbor is about 0, 1 electron volt and T prime is 10 times smaller. And you have some overlap integral. And we are going to use a continuum description which is called the muffin tin method. And here you see the experiments for the first, second, and third generations. What is the muffin tin description? Okay, so I like to teach my students to cook because that's the best way to get a wife. It's very, very easy. My husband has just cooked for me and I was there at his feet immediately. So they get things like this. This is a muffin tin, okay? It's a sadera para fazer muffin. So now you take the muffin tin and you invert it upside down. The Little circles there that are making now mountains are my COs. They are my repulsive potential with a potential of about 0 0.9 electron volts and the diameter is 0 0.6 nanometers. The effective electron mass we also know for the copper. And all what you have to do is to solve a Schrodinger equation in this confined geometry. Okay, we have all the parameters. So this is what we do, my student does. And then you go there and you measure the experimental uh, density of states at the red spots, at the blue spots, and at the green spots. And depending on where you are sitting, you are going to get different density of states. So for instance, you here you, you see a peak in the red and the green and a dip in the blue. You have a peak here in the blue and a dip in the red. And here more or less a peak everywhere. Three, oh my gosh. You get the tight binding spectra, and then you look, this is what we get from the theory. I we just got it accepted yesterday, so I was very happy about it. When you are at minus zero 0.3, you get a bonding Sierpinski, and minus zero 0.10, you get an anti-bonding Sierpinski. And then you measure, and that's what you get. So it agrees very well with uh, our calculations. Now you can go and look at it more in detail. So with the tight binding, with the experiment, with the muffin tin, as you put a third generation, you have many red lines, many green lines. It all agrees well. And now you fix yourself at certain energies. For instance, here at minus 0 0.3, you look at the experiment at the theory. You do it further at minus 0 0.2. Here it's a funny thing because it seems that my lattice is partitioning into little pieces. You do at minus zero 01, that's this anti-bonding uh, situation. And now you say, okay, but look, what I'm showing you, this is the instance of states. It's a wave function mapping. This is modulus of psi square. Can I now try to understand what happened to the electron wave function while sitting into this fractal? So for this, you can calculate something that's called the fractal dimension of an object. It's given by a minkowski bulligand method, which consists of doing the following. Looks very empirical, but actually it's mathematically based. You take the white region and you cover it by circles of a certain radius. You pick up a, a radius and you cover all your white region, okay? 
Now you count. How many radios did you get here? How many circles did you get here? And this is going to give you a, a point in a log n log inverse r plot. Here you get these rows. For this size of the circles, I get this rows point. Now, I increase a little bit the size of my circle. I cover everything again. I count how many. I get a different point. I reduce a little bit. I cover everything and I count how many. I get another point. I keep doing it and I get a straight line. And the slope of this straight line is the dimensionality of my object. Okay? So I did this for the wave function mapping. And I get that this slope is 159. Do you remember the dimension of the Sierpinski is 158 of the geometric Sierpinski? So my wave functions are getting the dimensionality of the lattice, of the fractal. They are picking it up. Um, then, but now when you look here, you will say, wait a minute. You are covering the white parts by the circles. But look here. Is this white or black? This is grayish. How do you decide what is white? Right? Tricky. Okay. So the way we did here, we decided that you have a peak which is the highest intensity. Then you say everything which is up to 75% of the most intense peak, for me, it's white. I paint it. Everything which is below 75% is black. And you get this curve. But you say, come on. I could have said 60%, right? Why 75%? Or you could have said 90%. How do you decide? OK, that's how we decide. We put dots for the 75%, and we put an error bar for the 60 and the 90%. And then you look at a curve that goes through it. It's 1.6. It's 1.59, which is the dimensionality of the Sierpinski. And you say, uh -huh, how do I really know that? Because you see, the Sierpinski is sitting in a 2D. What would I get if I would take a graphene lattice, as Manohana has been building? I would get two. That's the, the same procedure applied for the graphene. So it's really a fractal. This I am doing for the moment for the theory, for the theoretical data, for the third generation Sierpinski. Should it work for the first generation Sierpinski or the second generation? Well, we would not have expected. It does. You see, now I am doing what I did before for one energy, I'm doing for all the energies. This is lots of points, lots of covering surfaces and so on. Because each of these points comes as a slope of a curve. I have to do lots of stuff. The red one is the first generation, the blue is the second, and the green is the third. It's really fractal. It's really 1.58. Okay. And here I left away the error bars. This is 75%. And you can see there is a region where the data is deviating further. It's when I have this anti-bonding situation. OK, now let me show you uh, also the experiments. So now in this plot, I am showing you in light orange the muffin tin results, the theoretical results, and in dark orange the experiments, which are here. And now I go to the other lattice that I already built, which is the, um, the lib lattice, right? And you can have the experiments and the theory for the lib lattice. And this damned lattice is below two. And my poor student has been tortured because I asked, please do, redo, three do, four do. And it is always 1.9 around. And I think that now I understood because this lattice has some points which are like in one dimension but not fully, because they have also next nearest neighbor hopping. And this lowers the dimensionality. I'm finishing, Carol. OK, so we can go to reciprocal space. There is a mathematical way to, to, to define some quasi-Brillouin zone and go to k-space. And you can also do blindly, fast Fourier transform. These dots are the distance between the COs. And those ones here are the, the, the ones you get. And if you now filter everything which is inside the blue, you get this. If you filter everything which is inside the red, you get this. Inside the yellow, you get this. So the self-similarity for the third, second, and first generation is manifest in K space. And if you look at energy versus K, it's quadratic. OK, so I come to my conclusion. 
we have been experimentally building Sierpinski gaskets. The local density of states measured agrees very well with the muffin chain and tight binding. The analysis of the wave function map shows that this electron wave function acquired this fractal dimension. And now you ask the question, what will electron-electron interactions do there? How do I fractionalize further? What happens to the fractional quantum Hall effect? Should something in 1.58 dimensions behave like a Luttinger liquid in 1G, or like a 2G system, or completely differently? It is all open, okay? So I hope you help me start calculating. I will not go through my outlook. We are doing also orbitronics. And uh, if you go to higher energies, you get P band. So here you see P orbitals everywhere. We changed the design to get only PY, only PX, and PX, PY. And we changed the design to lift the PX, PY degeneracy and access only PX or only PY. You see here, there is only PY. There is a lot one can do a, at that, with that. But let me just acknowledge my collaborators because I am over my time. So uh, Sander Kempkes is my PhD student who is doing the design before they build the lattices. We have to find out which is the best way to build such that they can see the features in an accessible energy scale. Uh, Marlou is the main drive behind the experiment, so Marlou has been doing that and uh, teaching Sarsha how to do them. These are the two senior guys together with me, so he is the boss of the lab and Ingmar is the STM guy. And this is a technician who implemented how to do all this moving of the COs by computer. And I thank you all for, for your attention. Thanks, Cristiane. Now, Vlada. Thanks, Cristiane, for a very exciting talk. I would just like to make a comment. Uh, there are some physical properties, like critical exponents, that smoothly, supposedly, according to Wilson, evolve with dimensions smoothly. Uh -huh. And uh, if you could extend with uh, uh, in between dimensions. And indeed, I think the former advisor of Thomas here, uh, uh, Schreiber, they, they did actually a numerics for the Anderson localization transition uh -huh. on this kind of lattice, uh -huh. and they find exponents that indeed fall on this interpolation line. I see. So this is an example which is kind of what you expect, that this is basically just somewhere in between, yes. say, 1 and 2 and 3, and they uh -huh. have actually 2.5. Uh -huh. but, uh, but as you said, this is now getting very interesting because topological uh, features cannot yes. be smoothly evolving in dimension yes. and Wilsonian approach doesn't work yes. and indeed you know we could have a bet what will happen to the quantum Hall effect I think this is extremely yes. exciting yes uh, so. I couldn't show but we are doing also topological states yeah. we did uh, edge states I, I, we are now writing it down how to get topological edge states okay yeah, so you get Kekulé. So you have a non you have a trivial and a non-trivial Kekulé uh, configuration. And for the non-trivial, you do get edge states, and you can start smashing some corners to see their resilience to disorder, to defects, adding or in, uh, interstitials or additional COs, and they keep resilient. So it keeps entering, and uh, I can show you the pictures afterwards. And our, uh, our goal now is higher order TIs because they haven't been realized yet for electrons, just for uh, photons, and we are doing it. So that's now the, the, the goal. Yes. Hey, I had a question because in Anderson insulating systems, sometimes you also have wave functions that are fractal. Yes. So, but th there I know that you define fr the dimension as taking like higher powers of the wave function yes. and then integrating over. Yes. How is that definition of? It, it is equivalent. Okay. It is equivalent. Absolutely. And you even get multifractality at the transitions with the disorder. Yeah. We will go also deeper into that. Are Here, there more Hajar. questions? <laughs> So I want to connect the uh, second part with the first part of our talk. Yes. How do you, how would Feynman do QED in fractal dimensions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have no idea. You see, there are there is also these fractional dimensions that emerge when you are doing this diffusion, uh, which are when you have no ohmic diffusion, and in some of the cold atoms, this has been seen this fractal dimensionality, this is all open questions. I have been uh, investigating recently um, 
trying to do what Calderon Leggett did for the Brownian motion to do it for a Levy flight. Because a Levy flight would be a way to get into some fractal dimension. And uh, yes, it, it's an open world. There is a lot to be done. I guess along the lo lines of a lot to be done, have, have you done anything in a, uh, a magnetic field, external magnetic field? Not yet. Not yet. Yeah, so the, the aim is to get a substrate that can turn superconducting. What happens there here? To get a substrate that has a strong spin orbit coupling and then to see further topological effects induced by the spin orbit coupling. Because for the moment, the ones we have is just induced by determination. You see? And then, of course, the magnetic field. There are some theoretical studies, though, for the Sierpinski. If you put a magnetic field through the hole, because it looks like a funny way to do an Aharonov bomb now. And it would be great for the ones who do transport to get quantum dots connected by these edges in that way. And then you put a magnetic field. How is it going to be? How special should it be? But we have magnetic fields. We can go in Nijmegen up to 8 Tesla in the setup of uh, uh, Alex Kajetodians. And we just bought one STM with a magnetic field in Utrecht. So we will be able to do a bit. OK, we are out yeah. of time already. So I think okay. we can move to the Thank you. Let's thank uh, uh, Christian again.